All right, so I'm Seb Fry. I'm with Thunderbird Real Estate. And uh, I've been uh, asked to come in here and talk about opportunities in the foreclosure market. OK, what is a foreclosure? This is the technical definition of what a foreclosure is. Um, you can get foreclosed on for not paying your, uh, your bill, your mortgage payment, or you can get foreclosed on for not abiding by the terms of your, of your mortgage. Like, for instance, if you uh, rent it out to somebody and you say it's owner-occupied, they could technically foreclose on you for that. So it's also payments or the terms of your mortgage note. There's basically three kinds of, uh, of, of buyers of uh, foreclosure property. There's a professional investor, uh, there's an amateur investor, and there's the average consumer. And this presentation is kind of geared towards the average consumer. Basically, most people, I think, are, are looking at foreclosures to buy for their own primary residence, and so that's going to be our sort of focus today. There will be some information here for uh, investors as well. A professional investor buys at any stage in the foreclosure process, and we're going to talk about briefly what those three stages are. Um, and the crucial thing about an investor is that an investor buys really for cash flow or sure profit above all else. Uh, investors don't speculate on the value of the real estate. That's what a speculator does. An investor actually makes an investment that they know will give them a return. And basically, an investor will not typically buy uh, unless the numbers are, are right for the property. So that is what distinguishes a professional investor from an amateur investor. So an amateur investor uh, is typically looking to make money in the short term. They want to do a flip, and f uh, uh, flip the property very quickly. Uh, they think it's really easy to make a lot of money very fast without a lot of work. And they're more likely to speculate about the property's future worth. And in fact, the amateur investor is far more likely to lose money than a professional because they are basically speculating. And much of the foreclosure uh, phenomenon that we have today, a lot of it is driven by amateur investors who are speculating on the future value of their property and they bet wrong. So their loss is going to be, in many cases, uh, someone else's gain. So the retail consumer, which I assume is many of you, are looking to buy discounted real estate. And we're going to talk about um, some of that uh, in a little bit. Uh, you also probably have a suspicion that uh, real, the foreclosure real estate is some of the best uh, bargains in town these days. Um, and a lot of people I know uh, from talking to a lot of people, they're really uncertain. There's a lot of sort of misconceptions about uh, what it takes to buy foreclosure property. So we're going to talk about buying foreclosure property as a retail consumer today. So uh, there's basically um, three stages at which you can buy foreclosure real estate. Uh, there's the pre-foreclosure uh, stage, uh, which is before the home is actually foreclosed on. Uh, and that is often bought as a short sale these days. We'll talk about short sales in a little bit. Um, and then at the trustee sale on the courthouse steps, that is perhaps the most well-known stage of the foreclosure process. But as we'll see, actually a few people do buy at that stage. Um, and then uh, probably the best deals today in foreclosure are uh, after the foreclosure auction when the bank has taken back the property and is selling it on the MLS and in the open market. So uh, we'll be talking about that as well. So uh, it is possible to get in early on the pre-foreclosure, like before it comes on the multiple listing service. Um, this is where a lot of investors will be uh, applying their trade is trying to get at people before they put it on the MLS to try and uh, to get a deal in early before they have a lot of competition. So um, when you're late on your mortgage, the bank will file a notice of default. It's a public notice down at the county, and that uh, information is public. And at that point, the homeowner will start receiving all kinds of junk mail, perhaps telephone calls, perhaps even visits to the property from investors uh, wanting to uh, help him get out of his property, essentially. Uh, many times, even before the notice of default is filed, the homeowner will start receiving mail because you can actually buy lists of mortgage lates of people who are late on their mortgage. And in fact, you can even call the title company and say, I want to see a list of people who bought with 100% financing between 2005 and 2006. And it's a good bet that a lot of those people are going to be wanting to get out of their house soon. So for, for uh, an investor, a lot of people will want to get in on the uh, pre-foreclosure uh, part of the, uh, of the uh, process. And you'll see this a lot. You'll see uh, We Buy Houses for Cash. You may have seen those on, on bus benches or nailed to telephone poles. Um, and it's not necessarily cash that they're buying it with. They're actually getting a loan. A lot of times, though, it's just a come on, essentially, to, to get people to contact them to, to see how they can uh, sell their property quickly. Uh, and this, is the, this is a very time-consuming approach. If you buy like a book on like buying foreclosure real estate, they'll talk about this kind of stuff a lot. Um, but it's kind of like a career. It would be your job. If you wanted to go and buy a house like this, you would spend dozens or hundreds of hours pursuing uh, a house like this. And if you're going to make thirty or $40,000 on the deal, well, that would be okay. But 
a lot of people are not going to have that kind of time to devote into uh, going after uh, a property like that. But a professional investor, that's their job. That's what they do. So here we're going to talk about the short sale. This is where most retail consumers end up buying uh, their, their, their foreclosure real estate before the foreclosure happens. Uh, it's a short sale. That is that it's usually on the MLS. And uh, basically what it just means is that the homeowner is in a distressed situation and he owes more on the property than the property is worth. And you have to negotiate with the bank to accept what's called a short payment. So you maybe owe 700000 and all you can sell it for is 600000 So you need to negotiate with the lender to accept less money than is owed on it. So uh, there's a lot of short sale challenges. Let's see here. Is that all of them? Yes. Oops, I passed them all. There's uh, several short sale uh, challenges, and that is, is that there's no guarantee that the bank will accept a short sale price, right? So like, let's say it is 700000 you offer six, the bank might say, I need 625 really. And you're like, well, I don't have 625 I have six. And uh, that is a challenge that needs to be overcome a lot of times. Um, perhaps the biggest challenge, though, is that the banks move very slowly on a short sale. It might take months to negotiate a short sale. And that's also compounded by oftentimes there's more than one lender involved. Oftentimes there's a first mortgage and a second mortgage. So that can make things more complicated. Um, and again, at the end, the, the lender might turn around and ask for more money than is currently offered on the table. And that will uh, oftentimes kill the deal. Uh, and a big reason why short sales die is that a lot of buyers don't have the patience to sit around and wait to maybe hear back from the lender about maybe taking their offer or maybe offering asking for more money. So. Many buyers, after about uh, a month or two or three of waiting, will just say, you know what, forget it. And they'll go on and try and find some other property somewhere. And uh, a lot of times, um, homes will get foreclosed during the middle of the short sale process. Um, I've taken over some REO properties from the bank, and they were pending, actually, in escrow. They were actually working on the sale, and the bank foreclosed on them anyway. So that, that happens as well, which is strange, but it does happen. Uh, there are advantages to doing a short sale, and that is that the owner stays in the house and takes care of it. A lot of times, with the, if the owners are foreclosed on, they leave the house and it sits empty and vacant, and that's not necessarily good for a house. Uh, you also may be able to negotiate the price below market price if you are, um, if you are savvy and, and are, are good at communicating with the bank. You may be able to get them to sell it for uh, much less than uh, market price. Uh, another advantage of a short sale is that you can use traditional financing. You just go to your regular lender, uh, Wells Fargo, whatever, and uh, get a normal mortgage loan to buy the property. Sometimes a short sale can, in fact, be very quick. You have to read the fine print, which actually normally the public doesn't see the fine print, but um, the realtor does. And it will say, this sale's already been approved at such and such a price. And oftentimes that price is pretty low, and you can just go in there and, and pick it up relatively quickly, 30 to 60 days. So. Uh, they can be fairly painless if they've already been negotiated in advance with the bank. Um, and then there's a bonus with karma, absolutely. You are helping somebody not get foreclosed on. So you help everybody. You help uh, the lender and you help the neighbors uh, because having a lot of foreclosed homes in a neighborhood kind of gives it a bad stigma, really. So it's, it's a good thing, actually, to buy in the short sale process. It helps a lot of people out. So the trustee sale is the, uh, is the court auction where they, do the, they go to the courthouse and they have the auction. This is the most famous part of the uh, foreclosure process where they advertise in the newspaper. And then they usually go down the courthouse steps. It, it could be anywhere, but it actually usually is at Ocean Street at the courthouse steps. And the auctioneer comes and they auction off the property to the uh, highest bidder. Um, but few people usually buy here. It's, it's very rare for people to buy at the courthouse. Uh, because there's usually no equity in the property at the credit bid. The credit bid is the opening bid, which is the amount that's owed on it. And if, it's, if, if more is owed on it than it's worth, then who's going to buy it? Nobody's going to buy it except for the lender who holds the note. So about 85 or 90 percent of the time, the properties go back to the lender. So, and the rest of the time, it's usually a professional investor who buys it. If there's any equity to be had, it's usually the professional who knows about it and, and, and gets it. So uh, there's a lot of challenges to buying the trustee sale. The big one, this is a showstopper for most people, is that you have to pay in cash. You can't uh, use a check. And you can't use a loan. You have to show up with cashier's checks, basically, and buy it for cash right there on the steps. Um, and a big problem is that you have no chance to investigate the property. What if there's a mold issue? What if it was used as a meth lab? Who knows what's going Maybe it had a lot of flood damage. Who, who knows really what's going on in that property? Unless you have personal, intimate knowledge of that property, you're taking a huge risk buying a property without having done any inspections. Um, also, you may have to evict the occupants yourself. It could be that people are still living in the house when you take title to it, and then you have to go and evict them, and that's, uh, that's a lot of fun.
So, um, and then of course, here goes the money quote. Once you buy a prize, it's yours to keep. You, once you buy the short sale, you pay in cash, you can't return it. There's no, uh, there's no uh, refund policy. Once you buy it, it's yours. All sales are final uh, at the uh, courthouse. The advantages of a trustee sale, well, it's a very short list. Uh, basically, it's possible, I guess, to get it for, for cheap. It can happen. But given that there's other avenues to, to go for a uh, our, uh, foreclosure purchase, uh, I think that uh, they're probably more worth your time than trying to pick something up at the courthouse steps. But it is possible, if you have cash, to get uh, a property for less that way as well. Most people probably these days are buying uh, uh, bank-owned properties or REOs. That is to say that the, uh, the lender has taken back the property at the courthouse, the trustee sale, and the bank is now the owner of the property. And when, before they put it on the market, they will uh, evict the tenants, um, and they will remove the trash, and they will usually like, um, you know, uh, vacuum, you know, kind of, sometimes they'll paint and re-carpet, depends on uh, the competition for that property. But at the very least, they will take the people out of there and remove the trash. Um, and also, as another bonus, the property is sold with a clear title. You, you'll get it free of encumbrances and liens. So that's nice. You are getting a nice clean title when you buy the uh, foreclosure real estate. So the challenges with REO properties, probably the biggest challenge is that no disclosures are made. Uh, the seller is mandated to make a few small disclosures, like there's a standard uh, California disclosure, natural hazard disclosure about uh, earthquakes and flood zones and uh, something, uh, stuff of that nature. But the actual owner, the bank, has no real knowledge of the property whatsoever. So they can't really tell you very much about it. So uh, they don't really. It's the buyer's responsibility to make all the investigations. I should say that it's always the buyer's responsibility to make all the investigations. Uh, it's the seller's responsibility to tell you any material facts they know about the property. But with the foreclosure, the bank doesn't really know anything about the property, so they, there's nothing they can really tell you. Uh, but it, 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 there is more onus on the buyer to, to do a more thorough investigation than if you're buying just from a regular person. And uh, the properties are sold as is, where is, which is to say that you should really do your inspections before you buy the property. Uh, because the bank is not going to issue you credits. They're not going to go back and say, oh, well, you have a $10,000 termite bid. OK, it's $10,000 off, which a lot of times you buy from a person, they will, in fact, credit you some or all of a, of a termite bill, for example. Uh, the lenders don't do that. They want you to buy it as is. And that can be tricky when, if it's priced like 10% below than all the other properties, and there's a lot of bidders on it, you might not have time to do the inspections, and in which case, uh, you just have to make sure that you're not going to overpay too much. But usually, if it's that much competition for a property, it's because it is really cheap. And that the money you are saving more than makes up for any sort of uh, termite work that you might have to do. It's important to note that the, the well-priced properties will sell quickly, oftentimes with multiple offers. But I wouldn't um, worry about that too much. A lot of times, the multiple offers are not uh, very strong offers quite often. The REO properties have uh, some advantages as well. They are vacant, and they're easy to see any time, day or night. You can go, even without your realtor, you can go and walk around. Uh, you can go to the backyard, peer in the windows, take a look. So it is sold as is, where it is, but you do get an inspection period. So they typically won't give you credits unless like, the septic system has failed, or if there's some defect in the property that means that they can't sell it to somebody else, then they will usually cure it. But uh, termites, that's not something they typically consider to be a, a problem that's going to hinder sale. Uh, unless it's a, a safety issue. Um, and they will typically give you just a very small period of time to do your inspections, maybe about seven days. Uh, normally, when you buy a house, you get 17 days. So they, they want to give you seven days at the banks, typically. Uh, also, you can use uh, bank financing. like a, You can go down to Wells Fargo or whoever and get a loan to buy a foreclosure. And some lenders do give free appraisals and credit reports if you, uh, if you buy with them, namely countrywide. They're very big on giving you uh, free appraisals and credit reports. An appraisal is $400, and a credit report is probably $75. So that's, that counts for something. And uh, the biggest probably advantage with an REO property is that they are typically the lowest uh, priced homes on the market. And this is something that's been kind of surprising to me, is that Several years back, it was very rare to get uh, a house for anything less than appraised value. If you bought a house for $500,000, it's just amazing how often the, the appraisal came in at like $500 and $1,000. It was just like always a little bit tiny over the appraised amount. Uh, but now you're starting to see properties selling for 5 and 10% below appraised amount. And there's a lot of pressure on appraisers 
to not over exaggerate the values of the properties like they used to do. So today, if you buy a property and it actually comes in at 5 or 10% below the appraisal purchase, you really have bought at a discount. And if it's 10% and if it's, uh, it could be $50,000, $75,000 quite easily. So that's, that's real money that we're talking about. So uh, I want to touch on this a, a little bit, public auctions. There have been a lot of public auctions lately. They've been happening over in San Jose and, um, and San Mateo. Uh, and they auction off properties from all over the state of California. Uh, and there have been a few properties that are auctioned off uh, as well. And maybe you've seen the commercials. Maybe you're curious. I actually did go to one just to see what it was like. Um, basically, what's being auctioned off are the, are the bank-owned properties that didn't sell uh, through the normal retail channel over the MLS, right? So after you know, half a year of trying or three or four months, they'll just give up and try and sell it at auction. Uh, the opening bids are very low. Like People will say, wow, look at that. They're auctioning it off for $200,000. Unless the opening price is $200,000, I saw that they were typically selling for two or three times the opening bid. And they actually were ending up selling right around the price that they were actually on the market for previously in most cases. So it's not like you were necessarily saving a lot of money, but that opening bid does get a lot of people in there. It was packed. And then, of course, here's the bonus. There's usually a buyer's premium. The one up in San Jose, they were tacking on 5% of a buyer's premium upon the, uh, after the winning bid price. The one they had in San Jose, I guess they were tacking on like three or $5,000, so which is a much less than 5%, but still, it's something to consider. So uh, what's your typical REO uh, or foreclosure property look like? Uh, no, mostly they're in the South County area. Most of them, the, the, the majority, I would say, are in Watsonville or North Monterey County, Royal Oaks, uh, Prunedale, that kind of stuff. Uh, and the typical foreclosure property, although there's all kinds of foreclosure properties, but the common one is a smaller, older, fixer upper house. In other words, it's the kind of property that a subprime or a high risk buyer is more likely to have bought. So that is more typical, but that's not every house, but that is uh, more common. So um, there are foreclosures everywhere in Santa Cruz County though. They are happening more in Watsonville than in other places, but they are happening everywhere in Santa Cruz County. Um, and it's my belief that uh, foreclosures activities will continue to increase more in areas like SoCal, the West Side, Capitola, and La Selva Beach, because values in those areas are declining right now. And as the values decline more, and people are unable to sell their homes, uh, there's just not enough buyers out there for them, they will be forced into foreclosure. So I think we will see more numbers of foreclosures happening in, in the mid-county area. Um, yeah, and some foreclosures really truly are what you would call grade A real estate. Uh, like this one, for example, 310 Hidden Valley Road. It's uh, $1.5 million, previously $3 million. Pretty nice house, right? That's pretty prime real estate. The land isn't so much, but it's, it is a nice house. But you've got to walk up those stairs to get up to it, so that's kind of a drag. But here's a property I showed just this morning. Uh, this is uh, sort of over by the, the Valero station, uh, over by Safeway on the west side. Do you know this house? Look, maybe she knows this house. But uh, yeah, it's kind of an interesting house. I personally think it's a bit overpriced at 598, uh, seeing that in December of 2004 it sold for 695. I think it's probably more like in the 550 to 575 range, and, and probably will get there. And you could probably offer that on it. And after about a month, if it hasn't sold, it will probably end up selling somewhere 550, 575. Not too bad for the west side for a three bedroom. This is a property I checked out also. This is pretty nice. This is right off of Quail Hollow Road up in uh, Felton. It's on like a, uh, almost a 10,000 square foot lot. And right across is that big, huge, empty parcel of land on Quail Hollow Road. So it's very peaceful or very bucolic. 419, and it's a 1,745 square foot house that was redone like five years ago. And since then has been kind of abused a little bit. And the kitchen's very small, but it's a lot of square footage and it's in a beautiful, quiet place. Right over here in Capitola on Brommer Street, beautiful Brommer Street. Here goes a property, 434.9 for a house in Capitola on a, uh, on a 5,000 square foot lot. Not too bad, uh, considering that back in uh, September of 05, they were asking 759 for this property. It didn't sell. If they were asking 699, it probably would have sold for that back in September of 05, which was more or less the height of the market. Uh, oh, and then it has a sunroom too, sunroom not included. And here we go, down in uh, lovely Watsonville, California. Um, this is a uh, cheap little house, uh, three bedroom, one bathroom, 264. That's sort of representative of what a, a cheaper house in Watsonville will go for in, uh, you know, not in good condition, but not necessarily the greatest um, location in Watsonville. But 
still, that's pretty affordable housing. It's basically rent. It's slightly more than rent, not very much more. So this would be a good house for an investor to pick up, for example. You could buy this house and you could rent it out, put down 20%, and you're really close to uh, breaking even on it with 20% down. Now here's a question on many people's minds. Is it safe to buy real estate yet? Have we finally reached the bottom? Basically, let's, uh, let's look at this right here. This V right here represents the market, right? And uh, where are we today, right? We're at this uh, red arrow perhaps. Maybe we're not quite at the bottom, but I, I think that we're getting close. And most people, of course, what do they want to buy? They want to buy right there at the very, very bottom of the market. Unfortunately, we can't ever really tell where exactly the bottom of the market is until we've passed the bottom and are going up on the other side. So it's a little tricky. So basically, you, if you wait, you might end up buying on the other side of the, of the V on the way going up. And uh, that's good, except that in that time, it will swing more towards being a seller's market rather than a buyer's market. And at that point, the deals are going to be a little harder to come by. So um, it's good to buy sort of near the bottom of the market, and it's really hard to tell when exactly you're there. But uh, I think personally that we're pretty close. But I think that no matter what kind of market that you're in, if you're in a, a seller's market, a buyer's market, up or down, whatever you're doing, buy at the lowest price you possibly can in the market that you're buying in. Don't ever overpay for real estate if you, if you can avoid doing it. And this, the second point here is, I think, what got a lot of people into a lot of trouble, and that is they bought properties they couldn't really afford, and now they're, they're starting missing their payments, and that was a big mistake. So whatever you're doing, make sure that you can uh, uh, comfortably afford to make the payments. Um, and then here's another big thing that got a lot of people into a lot of trouble, is they used their house like an ATM machine. They opened up a big credit line and started taking out ten, twenty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 out of their house. And, um, that uh, was a big problem for a lot of people. Um, and then a big thing is, is don't speculate that your house is going to be worth more in two years. Basically, plan to hold on to your property for at least three to five years. And if you do that, if you buy now, it's, uh, there are no guarantees in life, but it, it close to guaranteed that it's going to be more, worth more in three to five years than it is today. OK, so I just have a few parting uh, tips for people. Uh, first, if you're going to go out looking to buy a foreclosure property, uh, get pre-approved by a reputable lender. So if you get from a mortgage broker, make sure that he's brokering his loan through a bank that actually has the money to lend to you. Um, study the market carefully so that you are ready to act quickly. When you see a price that you know is a good bargain, just be ready to move on it and be studying the market and waiting for that property to come along. And when it does show up, go and get it. Um, don't worry about there being multiple offers. A lot of times these properties will have many offers. I've had properties, I've had eight or nine offers on the properties of these properties, and this is just like last month, right? So of these eight or nine offers, probably only two or three were really competitive. So even though there are multiple offers, many of them won't be very strong offers. And uh, if you are doing a short sale, the key to success with doing a short sale is be patient. Uh, most of the time they fail because the buyer doesn't have the, the patience to wait it out. So if you want to do a short sale, just be patient. It could be a while, but if, if you are patient, you do stand a good chance of getting the, the home you want. Um, and then here's a big one, turn a blind eye to blemishes. If you are buying a property for 5 or 10% under appraised value, then who cares if it's you know, finger paint on the walls or, or whatever, or cheap pergo flooring. Those are small things that are easily fixable. And if you can turn a blind eye to that, you can see there actually really is a great bargain uh, underneath all those blemishes. Thanks for coming. <laughs>